Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, a new generation is in town. We look back at a week in cycling which seems to have confirmed a generational shift. We've also got all the action from the European Road Championships, plus the Tour de Pologne, the inaugural Women's Tour of Scotland, and an update on the latest rider transfers. Last week on the Racing News Show, we were talking about the enormous potential of 19-year-old Remco Evenepoel. This week, we we're talking about young riders in general. Have we just witnessed a big generational shift? This whole season, to me, feels like a changing of the guard. Established cycling hero Vincenzo Nibali having to make way for 26-year-old Richard Carapaz at the Giro, 22-year-old Egan Bernal winning Paris-Nice, the Tour de Suisse, and of course the Tour de France, in front of his older and more experienced teammate Geraint Thomas. Mark Cavendish, Marcel Kittel and Andre Greipel have had to make way for the likes of Viviani, Grunewagen and Caleb Ewan. I mean, of course, it happens all the time that riders' forces fade and are no longer what they once were, but this year, it just feels like that shift has happened very quickly. And this week, that shift feels more prominent than ever. Remco Evenepoel was only selected for the European Championships when Victor Campenarts, winner of the time trial there for the last two years, pulled out of it, citing fatigue from a rather busy early season. But the youngster didn't disappoint. He won the time trial, beating the likes of Alex Dowsett, Yves Lampard and Stefan Kung, and averaging over 54 kilometres per hour. It was yet another confirmation of his frankly ridiculous talent. In the words of Daniel Freib, Evenepoel needs to chill or he'll have completed cycling by the age of 22. Second and third in that event were Kasper Asgreen and Eduardo Affini respectively, meaning that the average age on that podium was just 22. And then, a few days later, Pavel Sivakov, a prolific winner in the under-23 category, took his first World Tour win by winning the overall at the Tour de Pologne. His age? 22. That backed up his win from the Tour of the Alps earlier on this season. The runner-up at that race overall was 23-year-old Jai Hindley of Team Sunweb, his first ever podium at a World Tour event. This tweet from Killian Kelly sums this season up pretty well. Uh, he said, I know it probably feels like this every year, and every year we just forget, but this year really, really does mark a new generation coming through, doesn't it? Van der Poel, Evan der Poel, Van Aert, Bernal, Carapaz, the biggest races are being won by a completely new cast. Which is so true. In fact, one of the only old school names to have had a major success this year is Philippe Gilbert. He won Paris-Roubaix in April at the age of 36. And I, for one, am incredibly excited about all of this. There are some really incredible young talents in our sport at the moment, and we are going to be treated to some amazing battles amongst them over the next few years. And I haven't even really mentioned Wout van Aert, or indeed Mathieu van der Poel yet, who incidentally won his third mountain bike World Cup race yesterday. That's the end of his mountain bike season for 2019. Uh, he'll now come back onto the road and start his build up to the World Championships in Yorkshire. Now, one rider who was very much a part of this new generation was Bjorg Lambrecht. Also only 22 years of age, the news of his death at the Tour of Poland last week hit the whole cycling world like a brick. I didn't know Bjorg, I've never spoken to him or had any contact with him, but I shed more than a few tears last week when I read the news. It really did put everything into perspective. Yes, he was a prodigious talent who was already doing great things and who undoubtedly would have gone on to even greater things in our sport. But above and beyond that, as Sai said on last week's GCN show, he was a son, he was a brother, a friend and a teammate to many. I can't even begin to imagine how the people who did know him are feeling right now or indeed how they're dealing with this tragedy. But my heart goes out to every single one of them. Rest in peace, Bjorg. The remainder of the Tour of Pologne, as you can imagine, had a rather large cloud hanging over it. Uh, stage 4 was shortened and neutralised in a gesture of respect, each team taking their turn to ride on the front, with Lotto Sudal leading the peloton over the finish line. The racing resumed though the following day for Stage 5, where Luka Mezget took his second sprint victory of the race, this time from a reduced group. Great to see him, in fact, back winning at World Tour level again, after a couple of seasons where he's predominantly been working for other people. The first GC shakeup though came the following day, and it was yet another young rider who was at the head of affairs. 22 year old Jonas Vangegaard, apologies if I mangled that name, but please let me know how to pronounce it in the comments below. Uh, but he found himself off the front with Sivakov and Hindley, and would get the better of both of them in the sprint to the line. Not a bad way to take your first pro win in your first season as a pro, and he even took the leader's jersey in the process. Unfortunately for him, he was unable to back that up on the seventh and final stage, succumbing to the pace being set by Ineos on the hilly circuits. Up front, Matty Mahoric was absolutely bossing it. 
He'd formed part of an early 14-man move, but clearly wasn't content with sitting in that group. He attacked them with still 56 kilometers remaining, and somehow found the strength to hold and even increase his lead as the line approached. He would eventually cross it first, 55 seconds ahead of Nilsson Paulus. Behind, Sivakov and Ineos managed to defend themselves against a flurry of attacks, and with Angergaard dropped, it would be Sivakov who took the overall honours, a victory which he dedicated to Lambrecht. Right, before we continue on to the European Championships, I just wanted to let you know that here on GCN Racing this week, starting on Thursday, we will have live coverage of the Arctic Race of Norway. That is for those of you in North or South America, except for Colombia, and also if you're in Denmark. If you're not in those countries, we will have daily highlights for all of you. Now, I understand that a few of you will be frustrated that you're unable to watch live, and that, I'm afraid, will be the case for certain other races too, but please rest assured we're doing everything within our means to bring you as much racing as we possibly can. We're also going to have daily highlights of the Vuelta Espana worldwide, just as we did for the Tour de France, so I'm very much looking forward to bringing you those. Okay, on to the European Championships now, which took place last week in Alkmaar in the Netherlands. Uh, it was the men's road race which concluded things yesterday, and although almost completely flat, high winds made for some very aggressive racing. From the start, in fact, in just a few kilometres, the race had split into multiple echelons, and the pace didn't let up until the finish line at the end of 173 kilometres. The race did come back together to an extent, but with around 25 k's to go, we had a bit of an unusual scenario. Elia Viviani, Pascal Ackerman and Yves Lampard went into a corner in the first three places of the group, and a slight easing behind by some of their teammates saw them ride clear. And that was it, basically. It was gone, despite the best efforts of the Dutch, British and Norwegian teams. Now, it's not often that you get to see two of the best sprinters in the world off the front of a race in a three-man break. And Paul Lampard must have been wondering how on earth he could possibly win. So, it wasn't a surprise to see him attack first. He went with three and a half kilometers remaining, and for a while, it looked like he might ride away to the win. Ackerman was unable to follow, frantically flicking his elbow to get some help from Viviani. But it turned out that the Italian was not only on an incredible day physically, but also tactically. He'd waited for that gap to open up before attacking Ackerman and going across to Lampard. At which point, it was a bit of a formality in the sprint. The Belgian had no answer for Viviani when he kicked with 200 meters to go. It really was quite the show of strength from Viviani, given how hard the race was. Average speed, just over 49 kilometers per hour. Things had got underway early last week with the junior women's and men's time trials, which were taken by Shirin van Anerooy and Andrea Piccolo, respectively. Uh, that afternoon, though, we got a glimpse of what is to come at the World Championships in Yorkshire, the hotly anticipated mixed relay. So the event was as follows. Three men were in time trial formation, leading off and completing 22.4 kilometers before handing over to three women who anchor the nation's hope to the finish line. The Netherlands were represented by Bauke Mollema, Raymond Sinkeldam and Kuhn Bauman. Uh, they then handed over to Florian Mackay, Amy Peters and Rianne Marku. And they looked very impressive given that they're not teammates for the rest of the year. In the end, they finished the day beautifully, uh, the Dutch taking gold by 14 seconds, with Germany in second and Italy taking third. If you watched any of it, we would love to know your thoughts on this new discipline. Is it a keeper? Let us know in the comments section just down below. Uh, the Dutch, in fact, were on fire through the whole week. Uh, Ellen van Dijk has won the elite women's time trial here every year since the event was introduced in 2016 and maintained her record here. The Dutch also won the junior women's road race of Ilse Plumers and the elite women's road race too. Uh, in that one, a break of Amy Peters, Eleanor Cicchini and Lisa Klein went clear with around 80 kilometers to go. They built an advantage that did at one point exceed two and a half minutes. Despite being a rider there though, the Dutch decided to chase behind for a sprint but then stopped with 10 kilometers to go. At that point, it was clear that the new European champion was now assured of coming from that breakaway as they hit the cobblestones for the final time. Klein was on the front, leading out the sprint, but Peters was not going to be denied taking the European title in front of her home crowd. Once she went, Cicchini was able to get into her slipstream, but no further. Peters therefore adds her name to a list that includes the likes of Mariana Voss and Anna van der Breggen. Other notable performances from the week came from Johan Price Peterson, who took the under-23 time trial ahead of Danish teammate and under-23 world champion Mikkel Björg. Letizia Paternoster took the under-23 women's road race in the sprint finish, and the Italians would double up in that category, with Alberta Denizzi taking the men's. Moving on, the inaugural Women's Tour of Scotland got off to the worst possible start last Friday. Stage one from Dundee to Dunfermline was called off midway through due to torrential rain and high winds, which buffeted most of Northern Europe last week. Thankfully, the final two days were able to be raced as planned. Stage two was 139 kilometers from Glasgow to Perth. Nine riders there formed the early break, which didn't go 
until they were on Duke's Pass. It included four riders from the Bigler team and former Herald Suntour winner Brodie Chapman. Most of that group were caught with 50Ks to go, but Chapman went solo off the front, building a two-minute advantage. However, she was unable to hold off the peloton, who caught her with 10Ks to go, and so we had a bunch sprint. And it would, in fact, be Chapman's teammate at Tibco Silicon Valley Bank, Alison Jackson, who would prove the fastest. Uh, Bigler, though, were out for revenge on the third and final stage. Cecily Uttrup Ludwig attacked towards the end in a bid for the stage and the overall honours. And although she was ultimately caught, her teammates would finish the job off perfectly. It was a 1 2 for them, with Leah Thomas and Elise Chavi, respectively. And with the bonus seconds picked up on the finish, Thomas would also take the overall classification by five seconds from Jackson, who finished fourth on that final stage. Right, we shall finish this week with the latest rider transfer news and start with news that's not really news at all. Vincenzo Nibli last week announced his move from Bahrain Merida to Trek Segafredo, something that has been heavily speculated about since I think March time. Uh, he will be joined there by his brother Antonio and probably also by his coach Paolo Slongo, although that one's yet to be confirmed. CCC have also announced another big signing in the form of Ilna Zakarin, who moves over from Katusha. Uh, that's a team who still appear to be in limbo at the moment, with no more news as to whether or not it will continue in 2020. L'Equipe uh, in France last week ran a story which claimed the team was set to be bought by Bjarne Rees, uh, a rumour though which he immediately denied. Let's hope for everyone at the team though that they get some positive news soon. Meanwhile, Germans Jascha Sutlin and Nico Dentz will both be moving to Team Sunweb in 2020. And that team has also signed up-and-coming talents Mark Donovan on a three-year deal and newly crowned European Under-23 champion Alberta Dainese. Mobistar have announced their new GC hopeful in the form of Enric Mass from De Kernic Quickstep. Again, something that's been rumoured for a long time. And they're also rumoured to be signing David Delacruz from Team Ineos. Uh, Mobistar have also signed Barbara Guarishi and Yelena Eric to their women's squad. Cofidis have been particularly busy in the transfer market too. Uh, on top of European champion Elia Viviani, they've also announced the signing of Guillaume Martin from Wanty Gobert and Simone Consoni from UAE. And finally, one of Viviani's lead-out men, Max Ruchesi, who won the Pan American Games road race last week, is heading to UAE Team Emirates. There he will be rejoining former teammate Fernando Gaviria. OK, that's all for this week's racing news show. Next week we'll be back with the Vuelta Burgos, the race which is often used as the final warm-up for the Vuelta Espana, plus the Arctic Race of Norway, which I remind you can see live in certain territories, and which features Mathieu van der Poel, and also the Tour de l'Avenir, the winner of which you can almost guarantee will go on to future greatness. In the meantime, Opie is trying to go pro again. If you want to find out what that is all about, all you've got to do is click down here.